Hi, Green Nines. Okay, so we're into topic six notes, which is the last, second half of outcome number three. So this is all about natural selection and artificial selection. So uh, let's start with the artificial selection. So this is where we breed uh, animals or plants or bacteria, for that matter, uh, fungus, in order to do certain jobs for us. So we have... Uh, done artificial selection with cows, chickens, wheat, rice, apples, all the variety of dogs have been a result of artificial selection. Artificial selection is also called selective breeding. Okay. And so this makes change really, really fast. So we could within, you know, two or th three generations make some change really quick. Whereas, you know, uh, natural selection takes millions of years. And of course, uh, when we do create organisms through artificial selection or selective breeding, it actually lowers biodiversity. So this is a little bit counterintuitive, but just picture a wild field with, you know, 500 different species of different plants. And then we do artificial selection and we plant just uh, tomatoes. Well, there's only going to be tomatoes. There's not going to be the huge variety anymore. So by using artificial selection in the long run, we're actually lowering biodiversity on our planet. And how do we do this? Well, you pick the traits that you want and then you keep choosing them. So if I want a small yappy dog that's able to chase rats out of my house, like the Chihuahua, I would find wild dogs that are small and then, oh, I find a yappy dog, I'll mate it with it. Oh no, but the they got a little bit bigger. I'll find another small dog and mate it until you get a small, uh, cute, yappy, dog that you call the chihuahua and then you inbreed them over and over again to keep those traits okay and so uh, that's how we create things we do the same thing with uh, uh, tomatoes and potatoes uh, we find a potato that grows really well we make sure we cross pollinate that one with another potato we can even combine traits maybe you have a potato that grows really well and another one that resists droughts cross pollinate them and then you have a the seeds that come out they'll make a potato that uh, survives drought and grows really well too. Okay, and we do that by selective breeding. Uh, why did we start doing this? Well, we used to run around and chase our food, but once we decided to stay in one place, uh, it became really important to be able to grow crops in a uh, sustainable way and a predictable way. And so that's when we started doing that. And of course, if you're doing that and you're also ranching, you need animals that can uh, collect, uh, herd the animals. And so they had to selectively uh, breed and create dogs that are good for herding, and they had to selectively breed uh, plants uh, that would grow well and resist drought. And uh, so that's all because we decided to stay put so that we would have all our resources we need without having to, you know, leave when winter came. Uh, the other one, the natural selection, is where nature chooses the organisms that uh, survive and pass on traits. So theoretically, or in theory, uh, the idea is that uh, organisms that are better adapted survive better and they pass on their traits more so. So 1831, Charles Darwin goes to Galapagos Island, sees all these different finches and looks at their beaks and then realizes they are especially adapted for the kind of food that they're eating. And then in 1859, he publishes his book uh, giving his ideas. Now, there is evidence for this in our fossil records as well. Okay, and so uh, it's a theory best best explanation and it'll keep changing the theory will get better and better we might find uh, something that doesn't work and scientists are always working on theories and changing them as they find new evidence uh, how does uh, the theory of selection work summed up in four statements all organisms make more kids than can possibly survive and there has to be all these variations with them now these variations are a result of mutations and sexual reproduction they both make changes and then some of these variations are good, some are bad, some are nothing. That The idea is the ones that are variations that help the organism to survive means that they'll probably survive to reproduce more so than the, the other ones. And over time, these get passed on to the kids. I mean, the, the whole idea about the giraffe, right? How did the giraffe get a, a long neck? Well, it had to be born with a slightly longer neck. The ones that were born with slightly longer necks got a little bit more food. They're a little bit healthier and they therefore able to you know reproduce a little bit better the ones with short necks uh 
didn't get quite as much food, so they were weaker and they didn't have as much energy and they did not uh, have a chance to reproduce quite as much. Okay, and so and then another, another mutation happens, and maybe there's a giraffe with a really short neck, and it won't get much food at all. Probably doesn't do very well. Maybe there's another mutation, and uh, there's a giraffe born with an even longer neck. Well, it even does better, so then it's able to pass those genes on. So you know, millions of years later, we have giraffes with beautiful but ridiculously long necks, best adapted for being able to eat from. Uh, the branches that are high up. Same thing with horses here. You could see the horses at one point in time, 55 million years ago, used to have four toes. There must have been something that changed in the environment that favor that worked against that and favored less toes. And so you can see 40 million years ago, we're now down to three toes. And then 25 million years ago, we're down to three toes. But the center one has become much, uh, the most of the mass is there. And these have gotten smaller. And you can see Five million years ago, the, these ones have become just like little buds on the side. And then today, like the two million year old horse is pretty much like today's horse. Uh, you can't really see any evidence of where they came from. But there must have been something environmental that favored less toes. And then sometimes it's really fast. Like here's a, the peppered moth example. So at one point in time, uh, this is like pre-industrial time in, uh, I believe it was uh, London, England, uh, the, the moths were on the trees. The trees were white, and then there were white moths, and then there were black moths. Now, the white moths on the white trees did quite well because uh, the birds couldn't see them, but the birds could easily see the black ones. So it tended to eat more black than white. So the black population was there, always very low. The white population was there and rather high. And then the Industrial Revolution happened, and uh, the soot covered the trees. And now all of a sudden, the trees are black. So the white moths got eaten up very quickly. The black moths now survive more and reproduce more. And then you had, within two or three years, a complete change of uh, moth color. So fat evolution usually takes millions of years, but it can go really quick as well. And so that is the end of topic six, and that's also the end of outcome number three. So there will be a quiz coming up soon.